This is Space Time, Series 23, Episode 79. Coming up on Space Time, debate continues over the age of the universe. Growing signs that a new ocean's about to open up in Africa. And Japan and China launch separate missions bound for the red planet Mars. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. New observations by the National Science Foundation's Atacama Cosmology Telescope have now placed the age of the universe at 13.77 billion years, give or take 400 million years. The findings, reported in two scientific papers published on the pre-press physics website archive.org, are based on a new more accurate study of cosmic microwave background radiation, the first light in the universe created some 380,000 years after the Big Bang, when protons and electrons formed the first hydrogen atoms, thereby allowing photons to move freely. The age of the universe also reveals how fast the cosmos is expanding, a figure known as the Hubble Constant. The Atacama Cosmology Telescope measurement places the Hubble Constant at 67.6 km per second per megaparsec. That means an object 1 megaparsec, or around 3.26 million light-years from Earth, would be moving away from us even if it was stationary at a velocity of 67.6 kilometers per second due to the expansion of the universe. The new calculations are in close agreement with the standard model of cosmology and support similar measurements provided by the European Space Agency's Planck satellite, which found the Hubble constant to be 67.4 kilometers per second per megaparsec. However, it doesn't resolve a lingering discrepancy with multiple other measurements of distant galaxies, which suggest the Hubble constant's more likely to be around 74 km per second per megaparsec, a significant difference. And this discrepancy between these two different figures has sparked concerns that either one of the sets of measurements must be incorrect, and both sides are equally certain they're not, or, more concerningly, that a new cosmological model of the universe might be needed. The lead author of one of the studies, Simon Aola from the Flatiron Institute, says the new data adds a fresh twist to an ongoing debate in the astrophysics community, and it raises the possibility of unknown physics at play. Meanwhile, the lead author of the other study, Steve Choi from Cornell University, says the new estimates agreement with the Planck data provides his team with confidence in the measurements. Both the Atacama Cosmology Telescope and Planck measured photons from the cosmic microwave background radiation, the leftover heat from the Big Bang, now cooled to just 2.7 degrees above absolute zero. Prior to this time, 380,000 years after the Big Bang, the universe was opaque, with photons created and reabsorbed almost immediately. The idea is if scientists can estimate how far light from the cosmic microwave background had to travel to reach Earth, they could estimate the universe's age. But that's a lot easier said than done. In fact, judging cosmic distances from Earth is extremely hard. So instead, the authors measure the angle in the sky between two distant objects, with the Earth and the two objects forming a sort of cosmic triangle. If scientists know the physical separation between those objects, they can estimate the distance of the objects from Earth. Subtle variations in the cosmic microwave background radiation's glow offer anchor points to form the other two vertices of the triangle. Variations in temperature and polarization resulted from quantum fluctuations in the early universe that were amplified by the expansion of space-time into regions of varying density which went on to form today's galaxy clusters. And cosmological models suggest that these variations in the cosmic microwave background radiation should typically be spaced out every billion light years or so for temperature and roughly half that for polarization. The Atacama Cosmology Telescope measured the cosmic microwave background radiation fluctuations with unprecedented resolution, in the process taking a closer look at the polarization of the light. The Planck satellite measured the same light, But by measuring its polarization in high fidelity, the new picture created by the Atacama Cosmology Telescope reveals more of the oldest patterns ever seen. This is space time. Still to come, early signs of what will one day be a new ocean opening up in Africa. And Japan and China launch separate missions bound for the red planet Mars. All that and more still to come on space time.
Scientists say a 60-kilometre-long crack in the Ethiopian desert, which first opened up in 2005 with the equivalent of several hundred years of tectonic plate movements in just days, will continue spreading, eventually forming a new ocean within the next 5 to 10 million years. The findings reported in the journal EOS, the Transactions of the American Geophysical Union, are based on new more accurate global positioning system satellite readings of the rate of tectonic plate spreading along the arid East African Far region, a triple point where the Arabian, Nubian and Somali plates are all pulling away from each other. Powered by convective heat from deep within the planet and propelled by seafloor spreading from the mid-ocean ridges, more than a dozen large tectonic plates make up the Earth's crust, constantly colliding together, tearing apart, sliding past or subducting under each other, and in the process breaking up old continents and creating new ones. The new data is allowing scientists to measure these plate movements with millimetre per year accuracy, allowing them to see what's happening in far greater detail than ever before. Over the past 30 million years, the Arabian plate has been slowly moving away from the African plate in the process, creating what we now know as the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden. Meanwhile, a slower, more gradual split has been seen with the African or Somali plate in eastern Africa cleaving off from the Nubian plate at a rate of about 5 millimetres per year. This has opened up what we now know as the Great Rift Valley, 6,000 kilometres of the Earth's crust splitting through Ethiopia, Eritrea and Kenya and going through to create Lake Tanganyika and eventually Lake Malawi in Mozambique. Scientists studying the badlands of the Afar region are already seeing dense oceanic basaltic crust, which is very different from the lighter continental granitic crust that was there before. Eventually, the Gulf of Aden and the Red Sea will create a new ocean by flooding in over the Afar region and filling in part of the Rift Valley system. This is already a region with some of the world's largest volcanoes, including the Uta Ali volcano, considered the gateway to hell by locals because of its often overflowing lava lake, one of only eight in the world and by far the longest surviving. This is space time. Still to come, Japan and China launch separate missions to the red planet Mars, and later in the science report, Israeli scientists have developed a new drug which could eradicate COVID-19 from the lungs in just a matter of days. All that and more still to come on space time. Japan and China have each launched separate missions within days of each other, bound for Mars. The Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency JAXA has launched an H-2A rocket carrying the United Arab Emirates Hope spacecraft on a mission to study the red planet from orbit. It finally blasted off from the Tanegashima Space Center a 1,000 kilometers southwest of Tokyo following a series of delays due to ongoing bad weather. What's this is ugly. We have a lift off the Itsu Buko Mano 42 from the JAXA Commission Space Center at 6.58.40 a.m. on July 20, 2020, Japan Standard Time. Following liftoff, the operation control of the launch vehicle has been switched from the blockhouse to the launch control center. The H2 is now flying above Pacific Ocean to the east. The H2 flight is on course, and the Tanishima station is tracking the launch vehicle very well. The SLBs have blown up. SLBs separation. The probe will spend the next seven months on its 500 million kilometer journey to Mars. The $200 million mission will study the red planet's atmosphere from orbit for a full Martian year, the equivalent of two Earth years. Its equatorial orbit will allow Hope to collect data on how weather on Mars changes across the planet over the course of a day and of a year. It'll also study how the planet's losing its tenuous carbon dioxide-dominated atmosphere. Hope's equipped with an imager and two spectrometers, providing detailed images of the planet's surface and tracking the composition of the Martian atmosphere. Meanwhile, China has launched its Tianwen-1, or Heavenly Questions mission, also bound for the Red Planet. 
The spacecraft, which includes both an orbiter and a lander rover, blasted into space aboard a Long March 5 heavy lift rocket from the Wingchang Spacecraft Launch Center on Henan Island in the South China Sea. The mission's expected to achieve Mars orbit insertion sometime between the 11th and 24th of February next year. The 3,125-kilogram orbiter will produce new high-resolution maps of Mars, analysing its surface composition and looking for minerals. Then in late April, the mission's lander will be deployed, using a parachute, retro rockets and an airbag to descend down to the surface, with touchdown planned for the Utopia Planetia. Once on the ground, a 240-kilogram rover will roll down on a ramp to the surface, spending 90 days studying the soil and searching for signs of past or present Martian life. Beijing's using this mission as a technology demonstrator for a future sample return mission to Mars, planned for the early 2030s. So far, only the United States has successfully landed rovers on Mars. A joint Chinese and Russian mission to Mars in 2011 called Phobos Grunt failed when the spacecraft failed to leave Earth orbit. As well as the Chinese and joint Japanese-United Arab Emirates mission, the United States is also launching a new mission to the Red Planet, the Mars 2020 Perseverance rover, which is targeting the 45-kilometre-wide Jezero crater and is carrying what will hopefully be the first helicopter to fly in the Martian atmosphere. A fourth Martian mission, this one by the European Space Agency in Russia, was to have launched this year as well. However, technical issues plus the ongoing COVID-19 coronavirus has forced mission managers to delay the flight until 2022, the next time Mars will be close enough to Earth to attempt such a flight. This is Space Time. And time now to take another brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. Israeli scientists have developed a new drug which could eradicate the COVID-19 virus from lungs within a matter of days. Researchers at Hebrew University in Jerusalem and New York's Mount Sinai Medical Center believe they could potentially downgrade COVID-19 severity to nothing worse than a common cold. Researchers revealed that the FDA-approved drug phenofibrate, or Tricor, could reduce SARS-CoV-2's ability to reproduce or even make it disappear. The United States and Canadian scientists are warning that we may lose most of the world's polar bears by the end of the century. The bears are facing starvation as global warming melts more and more sea ice around the Arctic. A report in the journal Nature Climate Change has found that the disappearing ice is forcing the bears onto land where food sources are few and far between before they've had the ability to store enough fat to survive. Scientists have estimated how long polar bears can survive without food before both the cubs and the adults start to die rapidly, finding that many polar bear populations have already crossed that threshold. Researchers say the cubs are the first to go, followed by the males, with solitary females likely to survive the longest. Paleontologists have discovered a new species of seropod dinosaur in northern Switzerland. Named Shalethemia schutzi, the 10-metre-long herbivorous dinosaur, lived in what is now the Swiss canton of Schaffhausen during the Triassic period approximately 210 million years ago. Seropods are those long-necked, long-tailed dinosaurs with elephantine-like bodies and feet that look a lot like Fred Flintstone's pet Dino. They include the largest animals that ever walked on the planet and were the dominant herbivores in many Jurassic and Cretaceous ecosystems. However, the origins and early evolution of this group is less well understood. The new findings are reported in the Swiss Journal of Geosciences. Well, as lockdowns ease and many people who have been working from home are slowly starting to return to the workplace, scientists are reminding people to remember their pets, who may now suddenly find themselves home alone, many for the first time. One thing that many people have actually enjoyed during these difficult months has been spending more time at home with their pets. And for some, it's been an opportunity to have a pet for the very first time. Now, after months of constant company at home, it can be confusing for animals if their owner's routine suddenly changes quickly. Veterinarians warn that some pets may experience separation anxiety if no one's around during the day. Dogs in particular crave human company, and so owners will be spending more time back in the office will need to condition their furry friends to feeling positive about time alone. Vets say the simplest thing is to leave them alone for a few minutes to start with, 
then 5 minutes, 10, then 20, eventually 30 and so on. That way they're not left feeling isolated for long periods. Remember, your pets love you, not just for food, water and shelter, but also as a dear friend. Other options include hiring someone to take your dog out for regular exercise during the day, invest in doggy daycare, or arrange playdates with your friend's dogs. Remember, pets are creatures of habit, so establish a routine that covers rest, play, exercise and alone time during the day while you're at work in order to return them to a normal habit. Also, encourage pets to play with their toys and to rotate toys regularly to keep them engaged. You can also make feeding fun with puzzle feeders, chew bones and scatter food to increase the time and mental energy spent foraging and eating. Medical authorities say there's been a drop in vaccination rates across Australia in recent months. Doctors are now trying to determine whether the reduction is due to an increase in anti-vaxxer campaigns or because of fear in attending clinics because of the ongoing COVID-19 coronavirus pandemic. Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics says the reduction coincides with a campaign aimed at politicians which is calling for a re-evaluation of vaccination programs. The most recent figures that I can find from the Department of Health we're dealing with up till March, in which case we're between 90 and 95 percent of children have been vaccinated, which is which is good. Yeah, yeah and you, you want to be up around 95 percent to achieve herd immunity, but you know different vaccinations have different effective rates. But during the measles outbreak in Samoa and in America and various places, vaccination got a big push as being a good thing. Obviously, people know measles and they're seeing people die. For some reason, during this pandemic, the COVID-19 thing, it has encouraged anti-vaxxers to come out and make a lot of claims, often totally contradictory. For instance, they will say at one stage that it's a hoax, it's a, it's a government hoax just to get you to vaccinate, and then you say the numbers are unreal and that a vaccine won't work and blah, blah, blah. So they can say contradictory things at the same time. Does it exist? Does it not exist? Whatever. But they've been receiving a lot of media coverage, unfortunately. Some time ago, we understood after a big campaign that was done by skeptics and various people around Australia, the media realised that most of the stuff, if not all the stuff that anti-vaxxers were saying was rubbish, and they stopped giving them publicity, uh, whereas once upon a time, they had a, an open slather. But it seems like because of this high profile, because of the pandemic is high profile, because a lot of people are very scared about it and the anti-vaxxers are playing off that, they're getting a good run in the media. One person said there's been a 900% increase, which is nine times the, you know, the coverage that they might have had some time ago. The actual numbers of vaccinations going down, whether that is a response to the anti-vaccination publicity or whether it's just the fact that people are in lockdown and don't go get vaccinations. They're not at school to get the you know, the kids who get their vaccinations at school. They're not necessarily visiting a doctor to get vaccinated. So that might be a reason why vaccination rates have gone down. But certainly the media coverage of anti-vaccination is a worry, is virulent, <laughs> pun intended. It is all over the place. Uh, unfortunately, they are getting coverage. When they have major campaigns, when they link anti-vax to anti-5G and saying that the vaccination doesn't exist, it's a con, and 5G is spreading the vaccination, which is part of the contradiction that they can have. There's a loony element to it, which has a has an attractiveness to the media, but it's also, of course, time of panic and you know, very great concern about someone trying to find a cure, which doesn't exist at the moment, or even a treatment that doesn't exist very well, and the anti-vaxxers are using that. And the fact is that the effect on other vaccinations, which you still need, you'll still need flu vaccination, you'll still need the triple antigen, the MMR vaccinations, all the whole range of vaccinations that people normally have, you still need, but the, the opportunity there to have them done by a doctor or whatever is, is lower because people are in lockdown by and large, or they just are scared of going to a doctor at the moment for what it might reveal, and the kids are not going to school. So for one reason or another, anti-vaccination rates are down. By how much? I don't know. And the very reason is that uh, people are not quite sure either, but certainly there's a major increase in anti-vaccination activity and coverage. And it's not just anti-vaccination. People aren't seeing their doctors right now for their normal breast cancer checkouts or, or colonoscopies, things things which prevent cancers through early detection. So where there's a great fear that there's going to be an increase in uh, diagnoses of these sorts of illnesses in the future. That's right, exactly right. Especially if the hospitals were taken up with um, coronavirus cases, etc. And they, yeah, you know, they're not. They're had... not. We're seeing very low hospital admission rates for coronavirus. Mm, I mean, so therefore it, there's room to move mm, for people to have, exactly. have these other treatments, but they're not doing it. Perhaps they're just frightened of actually finding out. I think they are. If they, yeah, I, I think, and I think that was also why a bit scared. They are scared, and that's to me that's the major reason why people are are refusing to have tests done 
because of what it might reveal and what that the impact that would have on working, if they are working or not, or what they can do. You can imagine a, a tradie or a contractor suddenly finding out he's got coronavirus and got to isolate for two weeks and there goes all the work he needs to do. It's disappointing, but it's not surprising that some people might be wary of being tested. That's Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics. And that's the show for now. Space Time is broadcast on Science Zone Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., and through both iHeartRadio and on TuneIn Radio. Or you can subscribe and download Space Time as a free podcast through Apple, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, Spotify, YouTube, Audio Boom, Podbeam, Android, Castbox, from Spacetime with Stuart Gary.com, or from your favorite download podcast provider. You can help support the show and the work we do by visiting the Spacetime online shop and grabbing yourself a few goodies, or by becoming a Spacetime patron, which gives you access to commercial free double episode versions of the show, as well as bonus audio content and other rewards. Just go to our Patreon page through Spacetime with Stuart Gary.com for all the details. If you want more space time, check out our blog, where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lower case, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, through our Spacetime YouTube channel, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 